This is going to be very brief. Uh, I promise 10 minutes I'll be done. Basically, we had a patient. I went to visit my friend who had lost a mom, and I met the uncle at home, very breathless. So when I inquired, he told me, oh, he has malaria. And anytime he gets malaria, when he gets this, he goes to the hospital and they give him malaria treatment and he's okay. And he was visibly wheezing. So I said, no, this can't be right. So I decided, or I advised my friend and I said, let's take your uncle to the hospital and let's have him checked out properly. So um, we realized that he had edema in addition to the shortness of breath, which he said was of two week duration. However, for about six months or so, he had been getting the malaria, which comes with the shortness of breath on exertion. Okay, so the symptoms had worsened to the point where uh, he was then breathless and also on top top leg any time he lay down flat on his bed. Like I mentioned, he had wheezing and palpitations and some dry cough. On further questioning, he admitted, like I said, malaria-like symptoms, which he thought were responsible for his uh, symptoms. Uh, he denied chest pain, nausea, vomiting, fever, night sweats, and any recent illness. He didn't have any significant cardiac or pulmonary family history and no history of uh, illicit drug use. What's happening to you? Okay, so his heart rate was between 100 and 110, and the respiratory rate was about 40. He was a febrile with a normal BP. However, he had distended uh, jugular veins and he had an S3 gallon. It was a long time I had used a stethoscope. My cardiologist called me to come and listen. And so, yeah, so of course his breath sounds were also decreased bilaterally and he had plus three bits in the edema. So at this stage, a preliminary diagnosis of congestive cardiac failure was made and we started investigations. Uh, ECG, we also did an echo, we showed global left uh, ventricular dysfunction. His ejection fraction was only 15%. There was mitral regurgitation and moderate tricuspid regurgitation as well. And pulmonary edema was also noted all on the echo. So immediately we did a chest x ray. And we realized that beside the cardiomegaly, he also had cephalization of his pulmonary vessels. There was mild pleural effusion. At this point, the cardiologist decided to do a coronary angiogram. The coronary angiogram turned out normal. This was a conventional catheter-directed angiogram. So what were we dealing with? We were still confused. But at this point, we had eliminated an arterial disease. And so we decided that why not do a cardiac MRI and see if we may find any infiltrative or uh, inflammatory conditions of the heart. So the MRI, Incidentally, showed diffuse mediastinal lymphadenopathy and um, evidence of myocardial fibrosis. The interesting thing here was that the pericardium was normal. So at this point, um, there's been enough talk on MRI and cardiac CT already. Uh, the CMRO showed this. This is, um, if you take one of the rings, this is uh, the mid. And so we are having the septal area somewhere here, inferior, lateral, and the apical uh, region for this particular one. And we found out that there were some um, signal changes within the septal area over here. 
Subsequent images will show you this is a dark blood or black blood. Just to look at the anatomy, and you see that there's extensive, of course, this was also fat suppressed. So we are seeing extensive fibrosis along the left ventricle myocardium as well as the septum. The pericardium was normal. Of course, there was a lymph node sitting right here. So because of the lymph node, we decided again to do a CT scan. These are all images uh, from the MRI. Then the CT scan also showed uh, pulmonary edema, bilateral pleural effusion, then diffuse with the external lymphadenopathy, the largest of which was about 2 cm, and it was somewhere posterior. So we thought this one, we can reach it through a biopsy. So why don't we biopsy again and see what is happening? So we did a CT guided biopsy uh, using a 1780 coaxial system and took the sample to the lab, I mean to the pathologist. These are images from the biopsy. My heart was in my mouth when I was doing this. It's a friend's ankle, and the lesion was so close to the aorta, and I didn't want to cause any trouble. But thankfully, we succeeded, and the biopsy report came out. And the conclusion was that there was a mediastinal, sorry, there was non caseating granuloma, which was likely sarcoidosis. There were a few uh, states that we could have done, which we couldn't do here. But the good thing is that when we did the serum calcium, it was very high. We did the ACE also very high. And so together with all of this, the conclusion was made that this was cardiac sarcoidosis. Now, what is cardiac sarcoidosis? It is a chronic granulomatous disease of unknown etiology and affects many organs, especially the lungs. The incidence is thought to be between 10 to 40 per 100,000 people. However, this incidence is also higher amongst Africans and people of African origin. In America, it is estimated that the annual incidence is about 35 per 100,000 people. And it is gender biased, so a lot more females. But the highest incidence in the world is actually reported in Sweden, where there is a rate of 63 per 100,000 people. It is thought that only 5% of people with sarcoidosis uh, actually get the movement of the heart. However, in Japan, they actually did a biopsy of a lot of patients with sarcoidosis and found out that almost 50% of them had cardiac involvement. And so it is not something that we should underestimate. It is something that is underdiagnosed and could have serious uh, implications, especially for those who get arrhythmias, ventricular arrhythmias. Some can also get heart block. And in those people, the death rate is about 65%. And so with improved diagnostic ability, we should not just say that this patient has congestive heart failure. We just go and give them lenses and give them all sorts of medications. We should work them out extensively. You should not have any patient with a congestive heart failure without having the appropriate investigations. You should do an angiogram. You should, if you don't find a cause, because there are uh, there's another, interestingly, a lot of people get congestive heart failure and they attribute it to something else. So I had a cabinet minister friend who came to my office and the guy was wheezing, his legs were swollen, and he just didn't see anything wrong with it. He thought he was very strong, so just this day, he feels funny, he doesn't know what is wrong, but he feels that things are not right. We listened to his landed and ECG echo angiogram and he had diffuse arterial disease at the end we put in six tenths on him and he didn't even know that he had a problem there were six tenths that's the highest i can recall anybody getting at one session because the other option is for him to have a bypass surgery which he refused you know so a lot of people when you see them and they are having difficulty breathing with the swollen legs and all of those things please advise them to go to the hospital 
That's another person who also thought he had malaria. You know, so as a doctor, let's encourage all our patients to go to the hospital and we may find a cause for the problem and treat it. Thank you very much. That's the end. Any questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Yes. Yes, 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 Yes,